Good morning and welcome to uh, First Fruitville Baptist Church Sunday School Hour. This is the first time that we've had Sunday School since I believe March the 15th. And uh, it's it's been missed greatly. And I'd like to welcome you here uh, this morning and also would like to wish uh, all of you mothers out there a very happy Mother's Day. Our Sunday School lesson this morning uh, comes out of the 31st chapter of Proverbs. But before we start, I would like to have a word of prayer. It's customary in our class to circle the tables, hold hands, and pray. And we haven't done that in a long time. So uh, I will uh, voice our prayer this morning in uh, hopes that uh, you will join in with me as we go to the Lord. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to bring the Sunday School lesson, Lord, uh, as abbreviated as it is, Lord, that uh, your name will be uplifted and glorified in all that's said and done here in this class this morning. Lord, be with our community, our state, our nation, and the world as we fight this virus. Lord, give us victory over that. Watch over our people here in this church. Uh, Lord, just uh, keep us healthy, keep us safe. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory in all that's done, said and done here today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. This morning's lesson, uh, I'm going to entitle <clears throat> The Value of a Virtuous Woman. Uh, this is a perfect Mother's Day message. It comes again from the 31st uh, chapter of Proverbs. To give you a little bit of background, the word Proverbs is a Hebrew word meaning to rule or to govern. And uh, these words provide <clears throat> a profound uh, thought of lesson and skills to apply to our lives. Uh, Proverbs is often overlooked uh, as, as guidance, but that's exactly what Proverbs is. It's, it's a way to live our lives a godly, virtuous life uh, for God. And uh, the, the final chapter of this, uh, this uh, uh, book of Proverbs deals with a, guy, uh, a man by the name of King Lemuel. And uh, you will not find him in the list of kings of Israel, but perhaps was a sub-king or a, a lieutenant king uh, to King Solomon. And the most important thing I could say about King Lemuel is that he had a very wise mother. And uh, most of the, the first nine verses of this chapter, which we will read in just a moment, uh, refers to the wisdom that the mother is trying to pass on uh, to her son. Let's take our Bibles, if you will, and let's turn to the 31st chapter of Proverbs, and we'll read the first nine verses. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son? What can the son? Uh, what the son of my womb, and what of uh, my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor <clears throat> thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink. Let they drink, unless they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of the many afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that are of heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his uh, poverty and remember the misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb, and the cause of all such as are appointed uh, to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. Now, let's examine those verses. Uh, each one of those verses deals with a wise thought to her son to guide him uh, in his job of authority over people. And again, remember, he is, he is not the king or a king of Israel. 
somewhere in in my study of this, uh, it, it it goes to it, it mentioned nicknames. Uh, the mule, uh, actually in the Hebrew language, means uh, somebody that is devoted to the Lord. And uh, I thought in in the studies of this. How many of us have a nickname? Did your mother have a special nickname for you as you were growing up, guys or girls? And would you share those with the church or have the courage enough to share them with the church? At least it be a name like Angel, Snookums, Bubba, uh, Stinky, or whatever. Uh, Mothers tend to give affectionate nicknames to their children because they love them and they care for them. Lemuel's mother in, in verse 1, uh, or verse 2 actually, is asking a question. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Now, that's kind of hard to understand. She, she's asking things of Lemuel. But she's got putting some guidance into this. And most of the commentaries that I read said that this refers to things that would destroy the kingship of a person if they practiced certain things. And most commentaries uh, that I read refer to this as of, of a sexual nature that says do not be involved in multiple sexual uh, relationships with women because it would bring down, it would break down the authority of the king. And she's trying to advise him probably as in an early stage of his kingship uh, that he is to refrain from those things because she has seen examples. Uh, for an example, Solomon. Uh, Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. And the Lord had warned Solomon uh, not to do this because it would break him apart uh, from his faith and uh, his responsibilities as a king. Let's go to verse 3. Give not your strength uh, unto women, nor the ways that would destroy the kings. Don't be sexually active. Down to verse 4 and 5. Stay away from wine and strong drink. Lest you drink and forget the law and pervert your judgment. Now, everybody knows that people that are under the influence of alcohol lose a sense of judgment. They lose a, a, their common sense. And Lemuel's mother is warning against that. Uh, stay away from strong drink, lest it corrupt you and, and cloud your judgment. Those are good words even today. Uh, it says, give strong drink in verse 6 and 7. To give strong drink to those that are uh, are ready to perish. Give wine to those that are heavy hearted. Basically what that says is to use wine as a medicinal uh, method. Uh, to comfort them, bring some comfort to them during their times of stress, their times of grief, their times of sickness. Uh, I don't know if I would agree with that or not, but I think that's exactly what the scriptures are saying. Verses 8 and 9. She admonishes her son to be honest, to be just, and to be fair. And I think we expect that of our elected officials today, to be honest. Sometimes people will make the claim it's hard to find an honest politician. It was hard to find an honest king in, in the biblical times or before the birth of Christ. There were many corrupt kings that were not fair, they were not just, they were not honest. And she's admonishing her son 
to, to adopt those characteristic traits uh, so that he may well serve his people. Look at, look at the, the thoughts in those first nine verses. This mother is trying to impart words of wisdom to her son. Did your mother impart words of wisdom to you as you were growing up? A loving mother, a virtuous woman, did exactly that. In today's crazy world, how many mothers uh, take the time to coach their children in how to live a virtuous life? It seems that there are very few mothers today that take that time, just quality time, to share the Word of God with their children. And what's so sad about that, these children are being raised up without the knowledge of God, without the wisdom of God, then they're having children and they are not coaching or teaching their children the ways of God. It's a sad world we live in today. It's a different world uh, from what it was just 10 years ago. And you'll see, I think you will agree that there have been a lot of changes brought about uh, in that length of time. We have single parent uh, homes where the mother works and the children basically raise themselves and they are not getting that quality time to share the word of God, to share God's thoughts on how we should live our lives. In other words, we lack a virtuous womanhood in our society today. I would like to uh, read now the, uh, the last uh, verses of chapter 31, beginning in verse 10. Now here, Lemuel's mother changes subjects. She's, in the first nine verses, she's trying to impart wisdom and, and guidelines for her son to live his life so that he might be effective in administering uh, justice and truth uh, and honesty. Here, in, in these last verses, last 21 verses, uh, Lemuel's mother uh, changes subject to the to uh, a virtuous woman. Uh, if you will read with me from uh, chapter uh, 31, verse 10 through 24. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is above all rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, and her candle uh, goeth not out by night. She layeth the hands to the spindle, and she uh, hands and her hands toward the st uh, this staff. That's talking about the weaving process there. She's busy. She's industrious. She stretches out her hand uh, to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household and for because her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Now that, that's, that's an important verse right there. Her husband is known in the gates because of the association, because of the ties to that virtuous woman. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth uh, girdles unto the merchant. Uh, 
These are all traits of a virtuous woman. Uh, she is well known. She's respected. She's loved. She's revered. She takes care of all the household duties while her husband makes a living. Uh, in our society today, we, by, by choice, or I guess by necessity, we have working mothers. But even though a mother has to work outside the home, that does not take away the responsibility of teaching the children the ways of the Lord. I would like to uh, read three verses of scripture to you this morning. Uh, that point back to a virtuous woman. The first one comes from Proverbs 9, uh, chapter 19, verse 14. Houses and riches are the inheritance from the Father, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 3 and 15. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Proverbs 31, 28. Her children riseth up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Is it a comforting thought to you that your children look to you and consider themselves blessed because they are your children? You know, we have relationships that, that uh, sometimes crack a little bit. Sometimes children rebel. Sometimes children are stiff-necked. But to be able to look back at their mother and their father with a love uh, is a precious thing that can, that there's, no, there's no price on our earth. There's nothing on earth that can compare to it, just like the rubies. Uh, that's a priceless thing to have. It's a gift from God. If you have, still have your mother or wife, even in these difficult times that we live in today with this virus going on, if possible, reach out to them today. Ladies, uh, you are honored today. You are blessed today. This is a day set aside to honor you. And I hope your family makes contact with you, whether it be by phone or whether it be by person, in person. I pray that your children will reach out to you, hug your neck, and thank you for everything that you've ever done for them in their life because most children do appreciate their parents. And there's a special love between a mother and children. We just, we have to agree to that. Uh, yes, we have a Father's Day, but on Mother's Day, it's, it's just a more special day because that mother actually gave birth to that child. And it's a, it's a very special day. So if your mother is still with you or your wife is still with you today, touch them. Tell them you love them. Tell them you appreciate them. Now, on the other hand, if your mother or wife has gone on to be with the Lord, you have some very special memories that you treasure in your heart. Ponder on those today. Think back to the years. You know, I consider my, my mother a virtuous woman. She wasn't perfect. She wasn't perfect. Only in my eyes was she perfect. But she shared with me my whole life, as far back as I can remember. She shared with me the, the godly spirit that the Lord had put in her heart. She taught me. She taught me a lot of things. She taught me a lot about the Bible. She taught me a lot about life. She taught me how to clean house, how to sew, whatever. Many things that I can never, you know, I can never repay her for. She prepared me, but most importantly, she prepared me spiritually. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, help us to honor our mothers. Lord, if we're fortunate enough to still have our mothers, let us take the time today to visit with them, even if by phone. Lord, just to, to make that contact. What a, what a pleasant blessing it will be to that mother to hear from her children. And if possible, Lord, if those children can be with their mother, just, just bless that time. Lord, may they treasure that time that they have with their mother. And for those that have gone on, Lord, we thank you for Christian virtuous women that have taught us and nurtured us and led us down life's pathways in the right direction. Lord, forgive us for where we fail you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
to wish everyone in our congregation a happy Mother's Day today to all our mothers, um, those that are mothers by birth and those that are mothers by love. Just want to say happy Mother's Day. want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, Joanne Harrison, my mother-in-law, Joyce Foreman, and to my daughter-in-law, Morgan Foreman. This is her very first Mother's Day. So we are very excited for Morgan this year. And I just want to dedicate this song to all of our mothers. You may see her in the grocery with her children. a mother, or a teacher, or a woman all alone, but she's someone else entirely when she prays. She's a prayer warrior down on her knees, wrestling Sisters and her brothers. Read. 
love you forever. I got a better idea. Sunday, and uh, we're still traveling along, and God has given us grace and mercy, and we sure look forward to uh, having service with you this morning. Uh, it's been a beautiful week, and uh, I've enjoyed the week, to be honest with you, and I hope you have too. 
uh, things are looking up, I believe, even though uh, it seems like we're out of church for just a little while longer, things are still looking up, so we're looking forward to getting back in here, and I sure do miss you folks. I have a few announcements this morning before I get started, and I'll go ahead and do this before I get into my message this morning. I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day. My wife's already taken care of a little bit of that, but I want to say it for myself. Happy Mother's Day to my mom in Mississippi, my mother-in-law, Joanne, and also, as Sandy said, Morgan this morning. I want to wish her a Happy Mother's Day as well, and especially all the mothers-to-be. Uh, maybe you have one on the way. You're looking forward to that, and I know you are. So Happy Mother's Day to every one of your special people. And I have a special message for you this morning. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to uh, share some announcements with you. Our prayer concerns, uh, we need to remember Miss Edith Eagle. She's down on the weather a little bit, I think, having a little complications with her breathing and all. Maybe some fluid, so let's keep her in our prayers. Uh, and plans for Justin Hawkins and Sarah Glenn's uh, wedding shower will be text to everyone very soon. And uh, hopefully uh, I can announce that next Sunday. Uh, but we just actually playing this from, uh, sometimes we're just doing this from day to day. We don't know what's going on or what's coming up with the way it is right now, but hopefully we can announce that next Sunday, and I know they're looking forward to it. We haven't forgotten our seniors, our, our, our graduates, our 2,000 graduates this year. We have three seniors, Jillian Rawls, Mallory Donaldson, and Allie Powell. And we are preparing a slideshow soon uh, to show on YouTube and our website. And when we uh, meet at the church, uh, they'll have tables set up for everyone to view and to drop off some gifts. So we haven't forgot about you seniors. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll hang in there with us. Just be patient. Uh, and that's exactly what we're asking our church to do as well today too because we're going through a lot of different uh, difficult times right now making decisions. But we haven't forgot about our seniors and I hope you're having a wonderful uh, year so far. So we're looking forward to having uh, our graduates recognized and we'll be doing that real soon. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer this morning, and we're going to get started here in this message because I have one to the mothers this morning I think is very important, and it seems like every year I think, well, how can I come up with another Mother's Day message? I've preached all I know, need to know about mothers, but mothers' jobs are never ending, and so I have a brand new one here from a text I've never preached from before, and it's going to sound maybe kind of boring to you when I first start off, but you just stay with me, and I guarantee it's going to bless you this morning. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's listen to what he has to say this morning on uh, this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you once again. And husband, treat her special today and uh, make her feel like she's welcome in that place as a mother. I know you will. Uh, treat her very kind today. She is a very special person. Let's pray this morning. Father, we're so grateful this morning. We thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the things you've done for us this past week. And Lord, as we've come to another week of, of preaching your word and Lord is singing, uh, what a beautiful thing it's been this morning as we've had everybody uh, uh, here taking part, more people uh, looking forward to hearing more about <clears throat> things that's coming up. And Lord, we look forward to gathering back once again with ourselves and other people around. Lord, the spirit that is here this morning, Lord, we look forward to sharing it with other people. Lord, take care of us through the days ahead. And we ask you to specially bless this Mother's Day, that every mother would have a special day as they share it with their family right now. They, be, they may be sitting around with friends, they may be sitting around with their family, their sons and their daughters. Lord, bless them this morning. Let them have a very special day. We give you honor today, and may you be glorified. That's all is said and done. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> as I said, it's a very special message this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at the genealogy of Christ and then see maybe where some of these mothers got their start. And I want you to understand something from the very beginning uh, this morning, mothers. Uh, you're very useful to God. You can be used and you say, Brother Tim, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what my life has been like. Uh, it doesn't matter what it's been like. What matters is the decision you make with Christ this morning to allow him to use you as a person that you are, that he made you. Uh, Christ loves everyone, and he loves you this morning. No matter what sin has brought it to our lives and whatever it may be doing this morning, he still loves you. And I want to prove that to you this morning by some ladies I'm going to speak about here in just a moment. I've entitled this, What Mothers Can Show Us. And these ladies here have shown us a lot of things in Scripture. What mothers can show us. So look at Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 5. And it says, as Simon begot booze, 
and Rahab and Booz begot Obed, Obed and Ruth and Obed begot Jesse. You say, Brother Jim, that's kind of boring. Just, well, when I first read it, it was to me too. If you don't know what's going on here. But I want to start by uh, preaching a message here to you, teaching you something about what this scripture means. And you can go study this when I'm through and read this with your family. But the book of Matthew right here is very important because the genealogy of Jesus Christ is right here. And Matthew presents his theme in the first verse. Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy and of Israel's expectation. Where did these come from? Well, these ladies here all played a part. These family, these people right here, these husbands, these wives, they all played a part right here. So the book of genealogy is Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, we think about old Matthew here. He was a pretty sharp guy. Uh, not only a tax collector, but he was pretty sharp. Not only with numbers, but he could write some stuff down that we would never, ever forget. Matter of fact, it's proven to us this morning because we're reading it and it's wrote right here. But as a former tax collector, also called Levi, Matthew was qualified to write the account of Jesus' life and teaching. A tax collector of that day must know Greek and be very literate, well-organized man. It's something that Matthew was a recorder among the disciples and took notes of Jesus' teaching. We might say that when Matthew followed Jesus, he left everything behind. Not everything. Except his pen and paper. I'm sure he brought it with him because we have his writings here today. Matthew nobly used his literal skills to become the first man ever to compile an account of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Well, what about these women here? What about What's going on with these women here? Well, we think about very special women in our world today. And I think my mom is a very special lady. I think a lot of ladies are special, but hey, you got to agree with me. Nobody's like mom. So as we look here, I want to share some things with you about Tamar. She sold herself as a prostitute to her father-in-law in Judah uh, to bring forth Perez and Zerah in Genesis 38. Well, what about Rahab? She's a very special lady. She was a Gentile prostitute for whom God took extraordinary measures to save from both judgment and her lifestyle of prostitution in Joshua chapter 2, also in Joshua chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Well, what about Ruth? Ruth is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's so humble of a being and a person called Ruth here. She was from Moab, a Gentile, and until her conversion out of the covenant of Israel. These four women here are very important. In, they have a very important place in the genealogy of Jesus Christ to show that there's a new place for women under the new covenant. In both the pagan and the Jewish culture of that day, men often little regarded for, had little regard for women. In that era, some Jewish men prayed every morning thanking God that they were not Gentile, slaves, or women. Despite that, women were regarded more highly among the Jews than they were among the pagans. So, I can't stand here and say this morning that women have been treated exactly the way they should have been all these years. But I can say this. You have a place in society today. Believe me. If it weren't for some of you this morning, us men would just probably fall all to pieces. Thank God this morning for some godly mothers. Thank God this morning for some women that praised with their kids, that taught them when they were growing up. Never forget what they learned. And we see how that was said in the book in the New Testament as well. So we look at some things here this morning. I want to get right into the message. But as we think about Mother's Day today, it's a Mother's Day all over this Christian world today. Preachers are pointing this morning to the mother we have all come to call Proverbs 31 woman. What a lady. And this wonder woman gets up before dawn and stays busy until the early hours of the next morning. You say an amen to that. I can hear some of you already saying that. And we've developed a, a mental image of her. She has the looks of a movie star. You're going to like this. I thought about this all week. The domestic abilities of a master chef. The stamina of a world-class athlete. The intellect of a professor with a PhD. The firm grip of political operations as if she's doing surgery. The wisdom of a godly missionary. The sensitivity of a Mother Teresa. The business sense of a Fortune 500 executive. The grace of an eloquent expert. And the spirituality of a Virgin Mary. Wow. What a woman today. What mothers are made of. 
No wonder so many mothers leave the church every Sunday feeling down on Mother's Day because they've done so much. Lighten the load a little bit for her today. Help her out. And probably most of them got up this morning, as a mother would do, and fix dinner for the whole family that's going to come and eat on Mother's Day. Can any of us measure up to the standard of that perfection? She is constantly a worthy goal for us to aim. And on top of all this, men, she will outlive us most of the time. But we all are in a process here. If it is the church's intent to reach her city for Christ, then we must begin to deal with men and women where they are and not simply where each of us should be. We got to deal with people. Now, what do you mean by that, Brother Tim? Well, you remember what I read a while ago about the three ladies? The first two were prostitutes. God made something very special out of them. They become very special ladies. And I would like to say this to the mothers today. Mom, if you're sitting there today and you're not living a godly life for Christ, you're not following Him in the ways you should, you may be a hard worker. You may have taken care of your family Better than any other mother around that you think. Or be the, right at the top of the ladder with, a, with the best mom in the world. But let me tell you this. If you're not following Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your savior. If you're not teaching people around you what a godly mother is. You've missed it all. And this is exactly what God is saying to us in the scripture this morning. As we look through this gospel according to Matthew. Can any of us measure up to a mom today? I dare say I can't. I wouldn't even think about trying. And the longer I live, the more precious I see how they are. The more I listen, the more I understand. So in preparation for Mother's Day message here, I ask myself a question. If the Lord Jesus was in my pulpit this morning and preaching audibly, what would he say to the mothers? I believe he would simply speak the truth, number one. He would lift them up and lift up the spiritually weak for number two. Put the fallen back on their feet, second of all. And have some good encouraging words for us all. And I believe he would do exactly what he did in the scripture. He would leave the 99 and go find that one who is hurting and lost. Mom, are you hurting today? Are things not exactly the way you want them to be? Are you worried about your children? Are you trying to make things better than you've ever have in your life before? Well, you keep striving to follow Jesus Christ and let him take care of the rest of it. There's just some things we are not made to worry about. And some things even a mom cannot carry. Let Jesus Christ do that for you this morning. Maybe it's a woman who has never born a child. Maybe you've been a mom to a child before. Or a man that you've seen that you helped raise this day and time. And you're so proud. You have nothing to hold your head down about. Or the mother who birthed a child and loved him, her, or him or her so much that she entrusted him or her to be raised uh, to someone else has brought wonders for all to see what he or she has become where this child lives. At any point today, let's allow our Lord to speak to each of us at the very point of our need, especially to the mothers today. So while this woman in Proverbs 31 is worthy example to emulate, she is also among the loaves that are listed in the lineage of our Lord. But two women in Matthew 1 and 5 are listed for their prosperity to see. Who are these two mothers? They must be a person viewed as a model of excellence. Two mothers? Well, not really. One is Rahab, the prostitute of Jericho. And she was a maiden who ran the house of an ill uh, uh, repute in the ancient town in the Jordan Valley. The other mother listed as Ruth, the godless Moabite. She was raised in a heathen environment. Listen to this, ladies. Worshiping pagan idols and gods. But something wonderful happened to each of these two mothers. Their experience with the living God caused them to be converted into two of the godless women in the Bible. And they live on in history and in heaven today. Rahab and Ruth were mothers who overcame their circumstances. Like many modern moms today, they were torn between work and child care. Many moms are divorced today. Others may be remarried and they're dealing with incredible adjustments and struggles in life that divide their loyalties. I promise you there's plenty of those around today. Others live with sorts of unspoken heartache in the home and are making the best of very difficult situations. 
Still others have husbands who cannot be trusted. Rahab is listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ to show us there is hope for those who have been engaged in sinful pleasures. Remember that. This is Rahab. There is still hope today. Ruth joins her in a list to show us that there is hope for those who have been engaged with social and societal pressures. Both of these women are remembered uh, forever in, a, in, a, in, the, in the realm of women today. If any woman today is sitting and listening to this message is a Christian, I'll guarantee you, if they've studied their Bible any at all, they've looked at Ruth and Rahab. I promise you that. So I want to look at them and learn from them on this Mother's Day. And may this be a encouragement to you because there's some things listed here that only mothers can have, if you know what I mean. So number one this morning, Rahab shows us how we can overcome sinful pleasures. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11. I ask myself, who is this mother named Rahab listed here in Matthew 1 in the genealogy of Jesus? Her story is told in the second and sixth chapters in the book of Joshua. And here we find a lady with a reputation that was far from spotless. I think sometimes the reason we hang our heads down and we don't get involved in society the way we should and uh, as far as men goes, there's not near enough leaders in men. But I think sometimes, too, there's not near enough leaders as far as women. I've always said this. If it wasn't for the women in the church sometimes, I don't know what the church would do. It seems like they may be carrying the biggest load of all, keeping things going. And men are following along. Women, you keep doing what you're doing. God's got a special place and reward for you when you stand before him one day in judgment. Well, as we think about these ladies right here, uh, we find a lady that was, uh, that was uh, far from spotless. And this woman called Rahab here, she was quite popular with the men who stopped in their caravans while journeying through the oasis of the city of Jericho. Everyone knew where her house was located. The local kids would point as they passed by, probably, and make sounds and sing songs and make fun. We've all seen that before. Five of the six times she's mentioned in Scripture the word harlot is placed alongside her name as if it were glued to her. And when her family members are listed in Joshua 2 and 13, there's no mention of her husband and children that I can find. And she was a lady who was involved in sinful pleasures. As all this is true, in Joshua 2, 13 and 14, she still has a good mind and a good thought of sensibility to look at here this morning. When the Israelites sent spies into her city as they were about to begin their conquest of Canaan, she took them in. Interestingly, she had not heard when they had done uh, what they had done for God during their march to the promised land, nor how well trained their armies had become. But what struck this harlot's heart was the, what the living God had done for them and through them. That brought a lot of things to mind this morning as I got to thinking about as I read that scripture and about the scarlet thread that was let down and the, the spies she took care of and sent off this kind of thing. It, I got to think, it seems like to me that it's a God-given, built-in inst instinct this morning that women sometimes know, mothers sometimes know before a son or a daughter even does what they do. Before they ever commit a crime, before they ever commit a sin, before they ever do anything good, before they ever speak a word, it seems like mom already knows what they're about to say or do. And I've seen it quite often in my wife, how she'll remind and, uh, uh, my son sometimes. And if you've done as, you, as a mother yourself, talking to your kids, uh, bringing up stuff before it ever even happens, and just having a, having a feeling that something's not right or something's good about to happen. It just seems they have a built-in instinct that they know what's happening. That's always amazed me. She becomes a beautiful example of how one can overcome her sinful pleasure to become a godly mother. I've thought about this often. I wonder today if the Lord were to call us all home in a rapture. I wonder if we ever get to, when we get to heaven, I wonder who would be the first ones we'd hear singing. Maybe it'd be a group of people. Maybe it'd be a, a, a people all together of different nations, tongues, and languages singing. But I'll guarantee you one thing, you'll hear the mom singing out in that crowd. Mom has something to rejoice over this morning. I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror, the, uh, the terror of you has fallen on us. 
that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord uh, dried up the water of the Red Sea and when you came out of Egypt. And, and this is the men here that's talking to Rahab as she's hiding them here in scriptures we've talked about. And what did you did what what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Shalon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth. And Joshua two and nine. Here are the words spoken of one of a repentant heart. Maybe not before, but as of now, as you study this scripture and look at this Bible right here that we're reading from this morning, there was a woman that met God right here, I think, with the heart of who she is. Maybe these men wasn't uh, for safekeeping and hiding. Maybe it was just for her. Maybe she's seen something that made her repent and realize who the living God truly was. If you'll notice and read Joshua 2, 9 through 11, it says he is God in heaven and above on earth beneath. And there's interesting insight here found in these few verses earlier. She took the spies upon a roof and hid them under the stalks of the flax, which she had laid in order on the roof in Joshua 2 and 6. Why was there flax on this woman's roof? Neatly and orderly laid out. In the ancient world, flax was gathered by industrious women, dried out and used for spinning. And weaving in the presence of such a large quantity, it fit her roof. And it fit very well. And it indicated that she had experienced a change of vocation. Interestingly here, enough is said of the Proverbs 31 woman that she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands in Proverbs 31 and 13. Not only was this a blessing to the lady, but you, to the woman at this time, but we see how God is having his way through the, and had his hand on the scripture all the way through here. Not only did this woman of Jericho repent, but there's good evidence that she placed her faith in the living God in Joshua chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. And when the spies went on their way, with a promise to return, they told her to hang a scarlet thread out the window of her home so that they would become, uh, would, would be able to come here and to conquer the city. Her home would be spared. And she replied, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and she bound the scarlet cord in the window of Joshua 2 and 21. Mom, I want you to understand something this morning. Whatever is being said in this message here, I want you to get this. And remember these words. Mom, it's not too late. It's not too late to do a work for the Lord this morning. When Rahab said yes to God of heaven and by faith hung the scarlet cord and when amazing things started happening. Now we're on God's time right here. God in heaven knew about the coming cross of which she was unaware. By the way, you do some study and research and you find this. The blood shed on the cross before the foundation of the world. God saw that the cross and the salvation is so freely offered and looked down upon her, looked down on her faith and saved her by his own blood. And as a celebration of her faith, she hung that scarlet thread out the window so that when judgment came and the walls came tumbling down, there was an obvious part of that wall that judgment could not touch because the scarlet thread here is a beautiful picture of salvation tucked away in the Old Testament. I spent about six hours yesterday and the day before in the office looking over some of these things about how God used a woman that probably most would have thought that was just worthless. And I see that all during my life right now. In the church, I see people uh, that, that you you got to be honest, sometimes you think, well, they'll never turn out to be nothing. Uh, they'll never come to know the Lord. And all of a sudden, God says, let me just show you who is still in control. Let me show you what I can do with a dirty, rotten sinner. And by the way, that's who we all used to be. We weren't any better than the, than the worst uh, sinner in the world today, if we want to characterize it that way or say it that way. We were all sinners. We're all saved by grace this morning. So as we look here at Rahab, she remembered a day on this Mother's Day to remind us there is hope for those who may have once lived in sinful pleasures in various types. Mama, let me ask you this morning. Mom, are you that person? Are there a lot of things in your life you're hiding and you just want to get right? Well, let me encourage you to do something on this Mother's Day. Do it before the Lord comes back. And do it swiftly. Find you a good Christian person. Find you a good Christian lady. A good Christian uh, pastor or someone that can meet with you. 
and you repent of your sins and you call out to that God in heaven and you let him start using you as he sees fit and let him take the things you thought that could never be made straight, made perfect again. Let him do it in his sight. So in today here, she lives on the history of heaven as a good godly mother who imparted the same qualities to her own family. Now, this other lady I want to speak about, second of all this morning, is very special to me. I've done a lot of study on her, I guess you say, in my, my full-time ministry over the years. And she's one that can be called out at any time. And people said, oh, you're talking about Ruth in the Bible? The Moabite? Yes, it's Ruth. Ruth is a very, very special lady. I, I think she would probably be one of the ladies in heaven that, besides my mom... Uh, when I get there, if she leaves before I do or if I go before her, I don't want to see or find when I get there. Ruth is a very special lady. Ruth, second of all this morning, shows us how we can overcome societal pressures. Now, there's not a woman alive today, especially a mother, that's not under some pressure. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Check that out. Who is this other mother listed in Matthew 1 and 5 in the lineage of Jesus Christ? Her name is Ruth. And she was a Moabite. Now listen at some things her life consisted of. And tell me this morning, do you have any excuses? Her obstacles was not that sinful pleasures, but of social and societal pressures. She was raised in a godless home. Not unlike many in the Western world today, she was raised in a pagan, anti-God culture. All the influences of her childhood were against her coming to know the living Lord. And by the way, we still have some denominations that's doing that today. That is anti-God. That is anti-Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for those today because the Bible says each and every person is going to stand before him one day. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And she was a member of a race that actually began in incest. Get that. Is that amazing or what? Not only was she raised in a, a bad culture of people that didn't believe in God, didn't want God mentioned, didn't even want to have anything to do with God, but she was raised in incest. In Genesis 19, 30 through 37, Lot slept with his own daughters. And she bore a son named Moab. The Moabites did not worship the Lord God. They worshiped the pagan god Chelmosa. They offered human sacrifices to him. Look what this lady was involved in. Do we have an excuse today? Not only women, but do we, do we have an excuse today as following Christ? They were degenerate people. In other words, who resorted to all types of uh, lascivious behavior. Wicked people I'm talking about today. As a pastor for decades here and, and, and for or days and it seems like years and, and numbers unended with pastors that go through this and hearing and teaching about this woman here. I've noticed that all these strongholds, the religion of our childhood is the most difficult ones to break. How many times have you heard this saying? And this is something we've got to get away from. Now, I'm not don't get me wrong before I say this. I'm not telling you at all to forget how you was raised. I'm not telling you. We can learn a lot from that. I thank God for my, for my childhood. I thank God for the way my mom and dad raised me. But sooner or later, somebody as an adult is going to have to stand on their own two feet. That's why we come to the age of, uh, and the, to, the, to the wonder of our minds, to the age of accountability. Why is that? Because we have to make a decision. I thank God for my raising. But how many times have you heard people say, well, I can't help it. That's just the way I was raised. I don't think God's going to take that as a legitimate excuse. Not when we know better. So I thank God for our raising. But sometimes or another, we got to look to the Lord and Savior. We got to thank him for what he's done. And we got to stand on our own two feet and make right decisions. Look at this woman right here. I thank God that she didn't follow the way that she was raised. She broke away from that. She came to the Lord and knew him as his Savior. So while Satan comes against those in sinful pleasure with accusations, he comes against those with societal pressures with obligations. 
Ruth that's listed here in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 as a godly mother to show us all that there is hope for those with pressures that you can't handle. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you sitting there thinking right now, how am I going to make it through tomorrow? How am I going to face this court date coming up? How am I going to face my son? How am I going to face people that I work with? Let me tell you, there's pressures everywhere we look. And there's a sense of false obligations here to the religion of childhood. Somehow or another. Now let's look back on the other page. We got to remember, as it says in the New Testament, the book of Timothy, how, what we were raised. Don't forget how we were raised. But don't count that for every step. Use it as some groundwork to stand on. A rock for a foundation for you to follow. To make some good common logic sense along with prayer and fasting and supplication. Let your truth and your prayers and your confessions be known to God. And I promise you, He will lead you in the right direction. So ask yourself, you may be asking right now, Brother Tim, how did Ruth become an overcomer? And these things I'm going to list before we close this message here. There's some things. If you've got a pencil and paper at your house right now, go ahead and get them. Ladies, uh, moms, go ahead and get this. And men, it's be, be good for us to remember as well. So I'm going to give you just a second to do that before I uh, go ahead and mention one of these. But how did she become an overcomer? She saw her mother-in-law, Naomi, repent and set her face back to Bethlehem and away from Moab. Ruth began to cling to her with all these words. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. We've heard that a, bunch, a lot of times. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will be, there where, uh, excuse me, and there will I be buried. In Ruth 1, 16 and 17. If you want to witness an Old Testament conversion, right there it is. Listen to that. Would that not be good for some Christian people today just to finally nail down and say those exact words apart from others today? Would that not be good for a society of people to do? To stand on something we can count on. Not living on the hopes and dreams and the instructions of everybody else around us. Now, I think laws are good. And I think instructions are good. But there comes a time in life when we've got to think for ourselves. And that would make people bold in the word if we would just do that. And put more trust and faith in what the Lord has said right here in the scripture. And use some of these examples of what these ladies have been through. It would change the world today. No doubt. So you got that pencil and paper ready. Right here is the first one. Ruth found a new determination. We're missing out on that today in the world. Women, mothers, you're missing out on that today. A lot of ladies are missing out on that in today's world. She says, entreat me not to leave you. All influences, everything you could imagine was against her at this time. It seems like to me she'd already been through enough and she... It almost seems like she would lift her head up and say, Lord, give me a break. Is there not any help here? It seems like everything in the world is still against her. Don't give up. This is where God's blessing starts coming in. The religion of her childhood was against her. The way she was raised. Oprah's example. She kissed Naomi and went back to her people and her gods was against her. Naomi's insistence. That she stay in Moab was against her. But faith brought a new determination in Ruth. That was A. What else did it do? B part of this. Ruth found a new direction. Whenever you go or wherever you go, I will go. Ruth was determined that following the God of Naomi would become her new life's direction. C. Ruth found a new dependence. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And she was saying that she would trust the Lord and Naomi for her basic needs. D, Ruth found a new desire. Young people shall be my people. Ruth knew that if she took the God of the Bible to her God, then she would take her people as hers as well. 
I did not take uh, me alone as a new believer to under, as a new believer to understand when I was a child in Sunday school reading about this book of Ruth here and, and reading about this lady that was so special. It didn't take me long as a new believer to understand that if I was truly going to go God's way, then I had to do so in the company of his people. And that's why I think people ought to join themselves together in God's house today. I think that's why Hebrews uh, uh, tells us forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews 11 and 25, I believe it is. It tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You, let me tell you, public worship is very important. And I can't wait till we all get back together in here once again. It's not fun looking at a bunch of empty chairs. Uh, 300 of them some, somewhere in that neighborhood there. Of looking at empty chairs here of where we're standing this morning. I look forward to the day we get back. And I hope some of us have found new directions, new desires, a new dependence. Ruth also found a new devotion. Your God shall be my God. The interesting thing about this to me is that she knew of Naomi's God was God of suffering and sorrow. Naomi's husband had died. Her two sons had died. And her heart was filled with grief. But Ruth watched Naomi and she knew her and her living testimony brought a new devotion to Ruth. Now, Brother Tim, what you say? Why is this so important? Young person, if you're a young Christian, if, uh, if you're not saved today, if you're a teenager, if you're about to graduate high school, if you're about to go in college, whoever you are today, here's my suggestion to you. You need to find you a godly woman to pattern yourself after. Is that not a good thing? In the world today. And I think every mom today would say that is a wonderful suggestion. If you don't have a mom that's living. If your mom passed away when you were a young baby or a young child. Find you a godly woman. Get into a godly church where the Bible is being preached. Find you a woman and get some of that good information that money can't buy. Listen to what she says. And I promise you. If you're not saved. And you follow her direction. That lifestyle will lead you into a conviction to follow Christ. And one day you'll become a Christian just as well. And you will find something you've always been looking for. You will find a God that will fulfill every need that you ever had a desire for. He'll take care of you in the hard times. I promise you. So Ruth found a new devotion. Ruth also found a new dedication. Listen to how this is unfolding. She's getting a little bit closer, a little bit closer every time one of these is mentioned. And I want you to listen to how this turns out. Listen to this. Found a new dedication. This is pretty serious. Wherever you die, I will die, Ruth was saying. This is for life. This is a life decision. I'm not coming back if these things do not work out just the way I think they should. She's not saying that at all. She says, I'm going to follow you to the end. I'm going to listen. I'm going to obey. And then wherever you die, I'm going to die. But this last one here was the one I really liked the most. Ruth found a new destiny. I think that would be something good that Moms could find a day. Mom, maybe you just need to find a new destiny. And let me tell you, if you're trying to find everything in the world to please you and you're doing it without Christ, let me tell you what you're doing in a, in a state. You're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time if you're not trying to find a new destiny with Christ. That's who you need to let lead you. Don't give up. Keep praying. Well, nothing's happening, Brother Tim. Keep praying. I can't see. Keep praying. It's just not. I keep praying. And you keep turning to your God. And you stay faithful. And God tells us in scripture. Among all brethren. That he'll pour out the blessings uh, from heaven. That we can't even bestow. We got to believe that. Ruth here found a new destiny. Where you are buried. I will be buried. I believe Ruth was saying here. That not even death will separate us. What happened to this. Formerly godless Moabite woman. Did she find a husband? This is just my thoughts. I say she did. She becomes a godly mother. Did she ever? Matthew 1 and 5 tells us the story. She returned to Bethlehem with Naomi. 
She married Boaz, the Lord of the harvest. You remember Boaz. He was the son of Rahab. Boaz and Ruth had a son whose name was Obed and had a son whose name was Jesse, who had a son whose name was David. Here we go. Yes, King David, the shepherd, the psalmist, the king. And I am sure this trust in the living God was transferred to her great-grandson. For later he would write, I have been young and now I'm old. But I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalms chapter 37 and 25. Can you tie all this together now? Can you see where God brought a woman to raise up a leader? Can you see how God brought her to a new direction, a new dependence, a new desire, a new devotion, a new dedication, and a new destiny? We all need that in our life today. One way or another, we need that. Moms, let me ask you. You remember what the title of my message was? After all of this you've heard right here this morning, and just a little bit about these women, and especially Ruth. Let me ask you this once again. What can you show us today? What can you show us today? All of these above things. And let me say this. Your mom of long ago did this. Look where our mom, our ancestor was. Look where we come from. Look what happened. And look what she did. It's made a big impression on each and every one of us today. No more fitting tribute has ever been paid to the wife than Ruth's husband said, all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Boy, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? We come from a Moabite, from a godless family, from a godless home, to a worshiping bunch of people that looked at idols that didn't want God nowhere around. And now we see a husband here that's saying that she's a virtuous woman. What a blessing, Ruth 3 and 11. Ruth, look at her this morning. She stares there in the lineage of Jesus Christ to show us that no matter what our past has become, and what it has put on to us, we can still be virtuous through the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God today for the forgiveness of sins today. I thank God today that I know a lot of people, and I don't know one person that's perfect, but I know a lot of people today that's forgiven. Yes, I think this right here for the question that I asked at the very beginning. If God was standing in my pulpit this morning, what would he say to the mothers? Well... If our Lord were here this Mother's Day physically and speaking audibly to us, I have no doubt that he would leave the 99 and come to each one that's troubled, lonely or lost, heart in order to impart and impute his righteousness to all who would believe so that it might be repeated that all the people of our town might know that you are a virtuous woman. You see, as we look at ourselves today, no matter who you are today, lady, no matter who you are today, mom, or a mom that's going to become a mom very soon, you see, we have no excuse. We have the best opportunity today to be the best that God has ever made us. No matter what you have been through, you still can be the best. And you know what? The only thing that matters is what God thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. They're not my judge. God's my judge. And he's also yours. So it's not coming in our ancient world here to list women in genealogy of the tree here of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the entire listing of those in the line of Jesus that costumes most uh, of the initial chapter of the New Testament, only four women are mentioned. One might think they must have been some kind of virtuous woman, but a closer look reveals a very interesting truth. One is Tamar. She's dressed as a prostitute, seduced her own father-in-law, and had an illegitimate baby. The next is Rahab the harlot, the harlot followed by Ruth, the Moabites. And finally, we meet Bathsheba. She was one who lived in adultery with King David. What do you suppose our Lord is trying to tell us in mother, on this Mother's Day? I think he's reminding us all that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. I didn't say that. That's what the Bible said. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the good news of hope for anyone and all on this very special day. Moms, happy Mother's Day. You deserve it. Let us pray. Father, what a blessing it is today as we've looked at this scripture and we've seen a lot of good examples for the ones, Lord, that's leading in the past and, Lord, for the ones that's up front now, single moms today, struggling and making it with their families, teaching and raising their kids, sending them to school, making sure she tells them she loves them before she watches them get on that bus and giving them their milk money and their lunch money, packing their lunch, taking them to ball games and making sure they're getting wherever they need to go as a mom would do. Lord, I pray that you would give them a little traveling mercy and grace today. And Lord, I pray that you would be with them. And Lord, you take care of them. I thank God today that I have a mom. And I thank God today that I have godly, a godly wife. Lord, we never need to forget that. Lord, let us look at moms different today. And let us understand who she truly is. And let us reflect back to the ones that God has set in front of us. The, war, the worst of all kind that made it. And Lord, I believe with all my heart they're rejoicing around the throne today. Just as sure as we'll see Mary at your feet as she was here in the Bible. Just as sure as we see Rahab. And Lord, all these other ones we've mentioned. Ruth, Lord, I think we'll see them worshiping you when we get to heaven. Lord, I pray today that all godly women will stay, will stay faithful to the end. And Lord, let us rejoice today we see you face to face. And we can all say glory be to God. Thank you so much for this blessed day. And may all moms everywhere today have a special day with you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.